the person that I have um, done a good deal of work on and studied is Mary Boykin Chestnut, and most of you know her as the author of um, a huge book, initially published as A Diary from Dixie, though that was not her title. Uh, Saturday Evening Post gave it that title. Um, and it was a compilation of, um, uh, based on diaries that she actually kept during the Civil War. And interestingly, um, she was either in Camden, uh, South Carolina, or Columbia, South Carolina. Camden uh, was the, her least favorite place. That was her home. Uh, <laughs> but she loved city life, and when she was uh, in Richmond, she kept fairly elaborate uh, uh, diary. And then after the war, uh, went through several iterations of trying to expand this wartime diary into um, what we now know as, uh, well, it's definitive edition, was published by, uh, edited by C. Van Woodward, and is entitled Mary Chestnut's Civil War. And this is, uh, this was published in the early uh, 1980s, won a Pulitzer Prize for Dr. Woodward, but really uh, seems to me Mary Chestnut uh, 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 won a belated Pulitzer. Now, uh, so you know just generally uh, who she was. She was born in 1823. She died in 1886. Um, and she was the daughter of uh, a governor of Virginia who also served as a congressman. Uh, but what I want to do today is, is really not a total Mary Chestnut thing, but I want to talk about her relationship with Verena Davis, because she and Verena Davis were uh, close and grew closer through the Civil War and remained lifelong friends. So, uh, uh, and they interacted with one another when Mary Chestnut was in town, in Richmond, uh, daily uh, uh, and uh, often several times a day. So uh, Mary Chestnut's diary then, or uh, memoir, however, whatever you want to call it, um, <clears throat> gives us a really good picture of what life in the capital was like, not on the battlefield, but uh, really what was, what was going on here. Uh, let me just start out by saying that Mary Chestnut and Verena Davis had a lot of similarities. Although um, Davis was three years younger than Chestnut, uh, both of them, um, her, her grandfather had been governor of New Jersey, so they both kind of came from families engaged in political uh, life. Both of their husbands had been United States senators uh, at the outbreak of the war. And in fact, James Chestnut was the first senator to resign his seat shortly after Lincoln's election. Um, and um, uh, uh, Davis resigned uh, his seat uh, slightly later, when, as soon as Mississippi, I believe, um, uh, seceded. Both of them were uh, well-educated, but largely, uh, I mean, mainly educated in um, schools for young ladies, and then educated by their voracious reading. Both of them were um, inveterate, uh, voracious uh, readers. They loved the social side of political life. Neither of their husbands liked that much. Uh, but Verena and Mary Chestnut were um, uh, very engaged in that, in that life. Both of them uh, maintained their drawing rooms and parlors, uh, depending on what was going on, as salon for um, the elite of the Confederacy not necessarily um, by uh, military rank, but more uh, correctly probably by class, uh, so that uh, Mary Chestnut might well have privates in her uh, drawing room, but they were upper crust. Um, both of them had a temper. Occasionally, each of them got into trouble uh, by not curbing their temper. Both had married at the age of 17. Um, and, uh, uh, and both found their f husband's families difficult to live with. So you can see they had a lot of sort of natural affinities. Uh, Verena Davis had been a well-established uh, center of social life in Washington at the time that 
James Chestnut was appointed to fill an unfilled uh, 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 a seat in the Senate in 1858. So when Mary Chestnut went to Washington, which absolutely she adored, uh, Verena Davis was there already as a as a as a central uh, female figure. Um, and and I'll let me just read a brief little quote that uh, Chestnut uh, writes in her journal from a section that uh, we call memoirs because. She claimed she did not have any, she had burned the diaries during uh, Stoneman's raid that would have backed up that section. My guess is there weren't very many diaries during that particular period. She just c collected scraps of notes and so on. Uh, uh, that's just an editor's guess. But she says this about uh, Mrs. Davis. Once for all, let me say, Mrs. Davis has been so kind to me, I can never be graceful, grateful enough. Without that, I should like her. She is so clever, so brilliant, so warm-hearted, and considerate toward all who are around her. After becoming accustomed to the spice and spirit of her conversation, away from her, things seemed flat and tame for a while. So there was really quite a lot of um, uh, uh, affinity there. Um, Mary Chestnut, uh, found herself in the thick of whatever was going on. So she ended up first in Montgomery as the provisional Congress was putting together. Jefferson Davis was elected president. Uh, Verena came slightly later, uh, but immediately upon her arrival in Montgomery, Mary Chestnut went to see her. They greeted one another with open arms. Um, shortly thereafter, Mary Chestnut went to Sumter, uh, went to Charleston, where she sat on the rooftop of the Mills House and watched the bombardment of, of Fort Sumter. Uh, and James Chestnut actually gave the order for the first um, firing on uh, Fort Sumter. He was passing on Beauregard's order, but it was he who, who did so. So uh, somebody's just written a dissertation uh, calling him the man who started the Civil War, which is probably not fair. <laughs> um, in 1861, um, uh, uh, mid mid uh, June, I guess, uh, the Chestnuts go to Richmond, um, and they find themselves in the Spotswood Hotel, where the Davises are headquartered. As is um, everybody else uh, who who figures in that very early period. Uh, Spotswood, by the way, was a brand new hotel that had just opened in 1860. It burned in 1870, so we don't have uh, we don't have a record of it. But it was right. At my understanding is it was the corner of Eighth and Main, right, basically at the bottom of the Capitol Hill uh, uh, square there. So quite quite uh, near the Capitol. And um, Verena immediately asked the Chestnuts to please sit at her table with uh, at dining table. And um, so she was in the thick of things from that from that point on. I have lots of pieces of paper here, but I'm not reading them all. They're just mostly quotes I thought I might be able to use, uh, use later. Um, Mary Chestnut's re recording of that early period in Richmond, uh, which encompassed the Battle of Manassas, where she and Verena Davis stand, uh, uh, wait for news of the battle together in, uh, in Davis's room. Um, she characterizes largely as um, it, almost a play war uh, with everybody very excited, uh, parading around in brand new uniforms, uh, bickering over places, uh, you know, what, who's going to be, who, who's going to be what. Um, and um, she, she regards it as, um, she's a little down the nose about it. She feels that the men are um, not serious, and they are too concerned about their own positions uh, and, uh, rather than the, the total war its, itself. Um, after the Davises uh, rented or bought, uh, 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 moved into the White House of the Confederacy, um, uh, the Chestnuts moved to another hotel. And then shortly after that, uh, later on in the um, uh, fall, James Chestnut, who had been offered by Davis what, what position would he like, uh, thought he wanted to be a senator. He went back to Camden um, 
Eric Chestnut regarded that as a uh, banishment. And um, turns out he was not elected senator um, for interesting reasons. And uh, Mary hoped he would become ambassador to France. Uh, that didn't work out either. Um, and so uh, he, he served as part of a military commission or uh, committee in South Carolina, uh, chair of the uh, military division of it, and got into, through, oh, throughout 1862, uh, all kinds of political scrapes with the governor of South Carolina. Uh, Davis, a couple of times, offered him uh, the chance to come back to Richmond as his aide. Um, finally, in uh, 1863, Chestnut uh, did so, and so they returned to um, they returned to Richmond. Uh, and at that time, first uh, Mary Chestnut uh, stayed with um, uh, a Mrs. Lyons, uh, rented the first floor of of a home uh, nearby. She had South Carolina friends th uh, visiting with her, namely the children of uh, General and Mrs. Preston three elegant, lovely daughters, one of whom, uh, Sally Buchanan uh, Preston, was that summer to fall in love with uh, or be courted by uh, uh, General John Bell Hood. Um, so there was all kinds of romance going on uh, in, in Mary Chestnut's uh, part. Uh, subsequently, she moved to 12th and Clay. Uh, we're not exactly sure which corner, but literally across the street from, uh, from the White House of the Confederacy. And, and, and all of that time, she and the Davises, the Chestnuts and the Davises, visited constantly, um, breakfasted now and again, had teas together, lunches together, dinners together. James and Jefferson Davis were off riding around doing various things. Um, uh, the, the women were um, sort of overseeing this salon that uh, Mary Chestnut was overseeing, this salon that I talked about. Um, and I don't know when she was doing all this writing because uh, she was incredibly busy. Uh, but um, entertaining, uh, particularly during the winter months, the officers who flocked into the uh, into the Confederate capital, um, uh, many of them found their way to a very chestnut story. Between January the 1st and January the 15th of 1864, uh, when, when the, one of the last things Mary Chestnut actually worked on before she died uh, was to excerpt um, the, that two-week period. She rewrote it several times, and one of those uh, pieces she called The Bright Side of Richmond. And in it, she is not only portraying um, the preparations for and the execution of these elaborate charade uh, evenings, but she's also brilliantly aware of the irony of playing charades in, uh, at the height or the depth of the war period. Um, which in many ways seemed to her to be a charade itself. Um, here's a little passage, Christmas dinner, 1863. Others dropped in after dinner without arms, physical arms, without legs, Von Bork, who cannot speak because of a wound in the throat, Alex Haskell lost an eye, for dinner, oyster soup, soup a la reine, boiled mutton, ham, bone turkey, wild ducks, partridge, plum pudding, sauterne, burgundy, sherry, and Madeira. There is life in the old land yet. Now you see the juxtaposition there of the people she's entertaining and the reality of their lives. And all she feels that she can do is to provide them respite. So, that's, that's the general point that, uh, that, that I wanted to make. Uh, she delayed returning to Camden and to, to South Carolina by one day in um, uh, 1864 because of the funeral of Joe Jr., who had fallen from, um, from a terrace here uh, 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 
at the White House. Uh, the evening before, she records sitting downstairs so that the family will have somebody there that, that knows the family and listening to Jefferson Davis pace, you know, the life, live long night, she says, uh, uh, above her. So that's the kind of sad ending of this um, uh, w interesting and um, uh, poignant and um, difficult period in Richmond. <laughs> All right, Kelly. Well, I'm going to uh, just introduce you to a few other women that were on the Richmond social scene. And like Mary Chesna, many of the women, uh, actually all the ones that I'll talk about, are uh, what I would say are outsiders. They weren't native Richmonders. They came from other areas, either uh, because uh, their husbands were in the army or in the government, or uh, because they were refugees. Hetty Carey was described by multiple people as being one of the most beautiful women in the South. That it was worth a king's ransom to look upon her, uh, and also it was worth a lifetime of trouble. <laughs> and uh, at the at the end of the war, she ended up marrying Brigadier General John Pedro, who then was tragically killed just three uh, three weeks after the wedding. Constance Carey uh, would end up marrying Davis's secretary, Burton Harrison. And her memoirs, Recollections, Grave and Gay, were published in 1911. And they, uh, they go into a lot of the social scene, as Betsy was talking about with uh, Mary Chestnut's. Uh, Constance Carey also takes some time to talk about the uh, theatricals that were done, or uh, in one case, it's a game of charades, but it's so elaborate. They have uh, these backdrops and everything. And uh, Jeb Stewart is very much involved in this game of charades and then is killed very shortly after this in May of 1864. So Constance wrote, and kind of reflecting uh, on this contrast as well, in all our parties and pleasurings, there seemed to lurk a foreshadowing of tragedy, as in the Greek plays where the gloomy end is ever kept in sight. a lot to paint a picture of life in Richmond during the war. She and uh, a friend of hers briefly spent some time in hospitals nursing uh, soldiers, and she records that experience, the experience of just seeing all of these wounded men, some of them uh, without anything to even lay their head upon. Another woman who left a, an excellent account of Richmond, and in particular of work in a hospital, is Phoebe Hember. And she came from Charleston. She was born Phoebe Levy. Uh, born, uh, she was uh, from a Jewish family. And by the time of the war, she was a widow. Her husband, Thomas, died uh, in July 1861, not because he was killed in the war. He died from tuberculosis. But she was in this rather uncomfortable position, having moved back in with her parents, uh, after experiencing uh, at least somewhat of a freedom uh, of being a wife. So she was looking for a way out, and through uh, the aid of Mary Elizabeth Randolph, who was the wife of George With Randolph, the Confederate Secretary of uh, War at the time, was able to get a job at Chimborazo Hospital. And she became matron of hospital number two and recorded her experiences after the war in A Southern Woman's Story. And uh, Phoebe Pember leaves this very moving record as she talks about uh, seeing soldiers die. Uh, in one case, there was a young man named Fisher who they thought was recovering well. He had gotten up, he had walked around for the first time, but as he got into bed, there was a piece of bone that severed his artery. And uh, Phoebe had to hold her finger there. And after the sermon, uh, the surgeon examined the wound, uh, there was no way he could uh, reach the artery, no way he could repair it. And Phoebe had to be the one to tell this young man that he would die the minute she released her finger. And uh, she said she couldn't do it. She, for the first 
or she couldn't make the decision to release it. But he had said, uh, go ahead, I'm ready to die. And she said for the first and only time in the war, she fainted. So she has uh, moving accounts like this. Uh, she also includes some humor in her memoirs and talks about her struggle of being in a, a male world, that there were surgeons who were very much uh, opposed to her authority. She had to wage quite a battle to uh, get control of the whiskey, which she was supposed to administer as, uh, as, as the ward matron, and she basically had to take the law and wave it in uh, the surgeon's face to, to get control of the whiskey. Phoebe also noted this, this contrast, especially at the end, in uh, the winter of 1864-1865. She said, there was certainly a painful discrepancy between the excitement of the dancing and the rumble of the ambulances that could be heard in the, moment, in the momentary lull of the music. Just ambulance wheels rolling by as they pause between songs. But she also went on to say that even though some of the older, sober-minded men look down on this gay atmosphere, that the, the young soldiers who were getting leave and coming in for the front said they needed this. They needed this sort of escape and this way to relax and get away. So Phoebe Pember, uh, she, because of her nursing duty, she fully committed herself to nursing. Many of the women uh, nursed uh, soldiers for a week or in the case of Sarah Pryor, uh, who was the wife of Brigadier General Roger Pryor, uh, nursed for several months. But Phoebe Pember uh, held her position at Chimborazo throughout the entire war once she accepted that position. And because of that, she did not uh, attend a lot of social functions. There were a few times when she escapes and gets away, but she's She's not a major part of the social scene because of her duties. Another woman that I just uh, want to mention is Judith Brokengrove McGuire because she has a connection to this home. It was her uncle, John Brokengrove, who had the house built. And uh, she, at the time, at the uh, beginning of the war, she and her husband, who was an Episcopalian minister, were up in Northern Virginia and Alexandria. And uh, in the course of the war, they end up refugeeing in Richmond. And one thing that she recalled in her memoirs was coming back into this home for a reception and seeing these rooms that she hadn't seen when she was a little girl. But she also uh, goes into a lot of detail on uh, the, the shortages in the city and uh, into some of her nursing duties at Robertson Hospital, which was operated uh, uh, by the ladies of St. James's Church, one of whom was Sally Tonkin. So those are just a few other women that uh, would have been seen uh, around about, and um, I will I will leave it at that. I mean